Hello, welcome back to Vidorama, where we remember the VHS releases of the past in graphic detail. My name's Admiral Jones. I'm an artist, and each month on this channel I paint a tribute to a movie that we rented on video back in the day. It's February, love is in the air, so what better time to paint that classic slasher, My Bloody Valentine, released in 1981. As you can see, I prepared the drawing beforehand. It's all set for painting, so let's do just that. Okay, the acrylic paint colours today are Mars Black, Titanium White, Rose Madder and Velvet Purple. All detail is applied with pens. Prior to this moment I rewatched the movie and made some notes and sketches and then I drew a main image which I then photocopied onto thin card. This is simply because I find that thin card is better to paint on. If you haven't seen the movie before, it takes place in the mining town of Valentine Bluffs and on Valentine's Day 1960, two mine supervisors, anxious to attend the traditional Valentine's Day dance, fail to check the methane gas levels in the tunnels. This results in an explosion which traps five miners. Six weeks later, they find only one survivor, Harry Warden, who had resorted to cannibalism. He was committed to a mental asylum and exactly one year later on Valentine's Day he returned to the town dressed in his mining gear and killed the two supervisors. He cut out their hearts and stuck them in heart shaped candy boxes and enclosed a note warning the town to never hold another Valentine's Day party again. Twenty years later the mayor decides to reinstate the traditional Valentine's Day dance and wouldn't you know it the townspeople start turning up dead, their hearts cut out and placed in candy boxes. The mayor and sheriff try to make sense of it all while the town's younger residents prepare for the dance, three of which are Sarah, Axel and TJ, caught in a love triangle. It's a terrific movie and in my humble opinion one of the slasher greats. It's also one of the greatest Canadian slashers produced during the Canadian tax shelter era which I mentioned in my Black Christmas tribute back in December. The movie plays like a whodunit with the identity of the killer only being revealed to us at the end. In fact, when filming, the actors didn't know who the killer was. The identity of the killer was deliberately left out of the script in order to not influence the actors' performances. By the early 80s, such movies as Black Christmas and Halloween had started a trend in holiday themed horror slashers. And in 1980, Paramount had made a ton of money with the success of Friday the 13th. Both Prom Night and Terror Train had also been released that same year and been commercially successful and so the floodgates were now open to all the independent film studios to make their own horrors, ushering in the golden age of the slasher. Film producers Andre Link and John Dunning, who had previously produced the early work of David Cronenberg with Shivers and Rabbit, were keen to get in on the slasher action. They consulted the calendar and noticed that nobody had made a slasher set on Valentine's Day, and so they approached director George Mihalka, who had not long finished directing his first movie, Pinball Summer. Link and Dunning told him that they had an idea for a movie, and they wanted to have it in theatres by February, which was only a few months away. Despite there being no actual script, he agreed. John Bird was brought in to write the screenplay, which was originally entitled The Secret, before it was changed to My Bloody Valentine to help sell the idea that this was a Valentine's Day themed horror. As the movie went into production, Paramount, keen to repeat the success of Friday the 13th, agreed to release the movie in both America and Canada. Shooting began in September of 1980 at the Princess Colliery Mine in Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, a coal mine that descended to the depth of 2,000 feet and reached 5 miles under the Atlantic Ocean. The mine had been open since 1868 but closed in 1975 with most of the tools and equipment left down there, the intention being to convert it into a mining museum someday. This particular mine was selected by the production crew as it was in the middle of nowhere and they were impressed with how run down and dirty it looked. And having finalised all the details they returned to film but were horrified to find that the owners had actually cleaned it up and repainted it. 
and so production were forced to repaint it again, uh, just an attempt to restore it to its previous state. Filming in the actual mine had its own problems. There was only one way in and that was via the mine cage which would take over 10 minutes to reach the bottom. Methane levels were also a concern and so particular attention had to be taken with how much lighting they could use and to make sure that the bulbs didn't overheat. As one can imagine there wasn't much space down there to work and uh, this lends itself to the movie, it retains a sense of claustrophobia. They also set out to make this a working class horror movie, moving away from the conventional suburban settings seen in other slasher movies. One of the other things that comes across in this movie is the friendship between the characters, it feels real. And this has been attributed to the fact that the cast arrived at the town a week before filming, forming friendships. It's not often you'll hear me say this, but there's an enduring love triangle in this movie between Sarah, Axel and TJ, bringing a tension to the movie. Again, it feels real. Sarah was played by Laurie Hallier in uh, this, her movie debut in fact. She went on to work on such films as Warning Signs in 1985 and uh, Night of the Twisters in 1996. In television she appeared on such shows as The Dukes of Hazard, Star Trek Voyager, Robocop the series, Friday the 13th the TV series and The Littlest Hobo in an episode which also starred a Bloody Valentine co-star Alf Humphreys. Axel was played by Neil Affleck who originally had aspirations of becoming an animator but worked as an actor in his uh, native Canada. He appeared in both television and film. He was in Chevy Chase's Oh Heavenly Dog and he also played a medical student in the mall on Cronenberg's Scanners. After this movie he felt that the acting thing wasn't working for him anymore so he moved to Los Angeles to work as an animator instead. He worked on The Legend of Prince Valiant and Rocco's Modern Life before he was hired to work on The Simpsons working as both an animation timer and director between 1994 and 2000. He also worked on other animated shows such as The Critic, King of the Hill, Rugrats and Family Guy. And then of course there was Paul Kelman as TJ who I always thought looked like a cross between Tony Curtis and Oliver Reed. Originally from London, he had a brief acting career, appearing in Canadian TV. He also starred in The Littlest Hobo, in fact. He was also in the comedy movie Gas in 1981 and of course Black Roses in 1988, but he will always be remembered for this role. Sadly, while painting this, the news broke that Paul Kelman had actually passed away on the 30th of January, having suffered with ill health for some time. This of course makes this year's viewing of My Bloody Valentine all the more poignant for many of us. Keeping the killer's identity a secret, uh, keeping things relatively spoiler free around here, Harry Warden was played by Peter Cowper, uh, a classically trained actor that trained in Montreal. He also majored in fencing and this and his height helped him to get this part where he brings an agile menace to the heavy breathing miner. He later retired from acting and raised a family and one of his sons was actually born on Valentine's Day. One of the things that makes this movie unique, along with Madman which was released the following year, is that it actually features a song, The Ballad of Harry Warden, wonderfully performed by Scottish born Canadian singer John McDermott, who lends an Irish folk feel to the ballad that recounts Harry Warden's origin story. It's reminiscent of The Legend of Boggy Creek, offering a folk tale feel to the story. The effects for the movie were created by Berman Studios, formed by Thomas R. Berman, one of the industry's greatest special effects makeup artists who worked on such movies as uh, Planet of the Apes, Food of the Gods, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Oh, and the 1978 remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. They provided makeup effects for both movies and television. Their work was documented in an interview for issue 11 of Fangoria magazine which shared various tantalising photos of the effects used in the making of My Bloody Valentine. George Michalka, who was already anticipating attacks from the critics for the movie's violence, promised many imaginative and bloody kills. When the movie was finished it was submitted to the Motion Picture Association of America uh, the MPAA for classification in January 1981 but at this moment in time all was not well in Hollywood. John Lennon had been murdered the previous month 
and the media was receiving the backlash for the way it depicted violence in movies. So the MPAA made My Bloody Valentine their scapegoat. They demanded that most of the violence and the gore be cut from the film or it would not be awarded an R rating. With their Valentine's Day release date looming ever closer, they had no choice but to comply, cutting nine minutes from the film, essentially making My Bloody Valentine considerably less bloody than originally intended. Every kill in the movie was altered in some way, some deaths removed completely. For a long time it was hoped that an uncut version would someday be released, but it seems that most of the footage was either lost or destroyed. Side note, even when the movie was released on DVD and Blu-ray in 2009, featuring what cut scenes they had, it still only featured a fraction of what they filmed. I do like adding blood and gore to these paintings. It's strangely relaxing. I often say this, but I have trouble holding back, uh, reining myself in. But going back to the movie, despite being heavily cut, on its release, the critics criticised the movie for its blood and violence. And they just dismissed it as another slasher movie. Even the Canadian Film Development Corporation, the CFDC, was criticised for funding such a movie. But despite the efforts of the censors and the critics, the movie did make money at the box office. But obviously not on the scale that Paramount had hoped for. And so the movie became a, yep, yeah, you guessed it, a cult classic. Its popularity has increased somewhat in previous years, completely disregarding the remake. Harry Warden has managed to climb out of the Henniger mine and win a place in all our hearts. So if you haven't got round to seeing it yet, be sure to show my bloody Valentine some love this Valentine. Thank you for joining me today and keeping me company. As ever, I hope that was of interest to you and that you approve of the final painting. If so, perhaps you'll give this video a thumbs up or even share it with your friends. And if you'd like to support my little channel out further, you'll find links in the description to the Etsy store and the Patreon page. It all helps to support my art. If you're a fan of slasher movies, I've just added a slasher playlist to the channel which features all my previous slasher movie tribute paintings, and I hope to update it accordingly. So thank you again for watching, and until next time, good night out there, whatever you are.